is my privilege to officially welcome all of our graduates and their families to this evening's baccalaureate service on our 43rd annual commencement weekend. Welcome. We We are excited about tomorrow's commencement. Over 34,000 are expected to attend the ceremony in Williams Stadium. Weather reports are good. I was watching the Weather Channel this afternoon, not the one that, it's a new Weather Channel. The old one is just shows about tornadoes and all now, so. But I watched the new one that really shows the weather, and it looks like there's a little front moving through, so just pray that there won't be any rain tomorrow morning. But we. We're planning for the ceremony to be shorter than in the past. Don't get your hopes up, though, because we, we try to do that every year. We, we do have some big surprises for you tomorrow, so be sure to attend the main ceremony at 10 a.m. You'll be glad you did. You never know who might show up at Liberty University. We will be selling the LU logo pin this weekend. They'll be available all over campus for $2 each, and all the proceeds will go to the Liberty Godparent Home for unwed mothers. Tomorrow, and by the way, parents and guests, the faculty and staff don't always dress like this here at Liberty. We, I've lobbied hard to, to get rid of these at commencement, but I've not had any success. We, everybody used to wear hats like some of the crowd are wearing now, and this fella right here's got a Star Wars cap on, I see. That's pretty cool. But, but my father, one year my father, I'm told it was before my time, he just said, no more hats. And so that was the end of that tradition, but I haven't had the same luck with the robes. But tomorrow we will be honoring the largest graduating class in Liberty University's history, 19,000. <laughs> Nineteen thousand four hundred and thirty degrees will be conferred tomorrow, up from seventeen thousand five hundred last year. We are graduates. We are so proud of you, and we're looking forward to celebrating this great accomplishment throughout this special weekend. You are entering a challenging job market and a culture that is often hostile to Christian values. But we, we believe you are ready to become the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We believe in you. We, we believe in you because we know your faith has taken deep roots here, and we are confident that you will leave Liberty knowing not only how to make a living, but also how to live. We look forward to hearing about all your career successes and the example that you will become in your service to others. Liberty students have always had the reputation of being service-oriented. One of the first things Becky and I noticed when I became president in 2007 was how Liberty students radiated the love of Christ and how their lives were a reflection of the great commandment of Jesus to love God and love others. We constantly hear compliments from our students, landlords, employers, and visitors to campus. I am proud to report tonight that Liberty students are continuing to demonstrate the Christian ideals that have defined them for decades. Tonight's occasion, the baccalaureate service, is a Christian tradition that is as old as the university tradition in America itself. The early founders of America's universities left behind many of the traditions of European higher education, yet they kept this one intact and treated it with a certain reverence. The baccalaureate service is believed to have begun in the early 15th century at Oxford University and involved every male graduate delivering, delivering a sermon in Latin. Tim, your Latin? You brushed up on your Latin, but the uh, baccalaureate service eventually was treated more like an official worship service where the, university commuted, where the university community gathered prior to commencement to give God the glory for their great achievement. Yet as the American Academy became increasingly secularized, baccalaureate services were de-emphasized, and today if they exist at all, they are considered unofficial services often endorsed only by a student club, sometimes not even allowed to meet on campus, and almost never endorsed by the university itself. The sad fact is that God has been steadily uninvited to commencement at most universities in America, but not here. At Liberty University, God is the guest of honor.
The first European inhabitants of the original 13 colonies would not believe, nor would they accept the alienation of faith from the academy. Quite to the contrary, they wrote Christianity into the founding creeds of America's first universities. They carved Bible verses into stone facades of buildings and erected monuments to pastors and missionaries. The mottos of four of America's Ivy League universities provide a glimpse of the original Christian mission of each institution. These include Brown University, whose motto is, In God We Hope. Princeton's motto remains, Under God's Power She Flourishes. And Yale's is still light and truth. The seal of Columbia University has Psalm 36.9 inscribed in Latin, which reads, In thy light we shall see light. All very similar to Liberty's motto of training champions for Christ. Our fervent prayer for Liberty University is that it will remain true to its Christian roots in perpetuity, and that your children, grandchildren, and gener excuse me, generations of their descendants will sit in a service just like this one to thank God for their Liberty University education. And in An important part of the commencement ceremony tomorrow will be devoted to honoring veterans who have defended this nation and have sacrificed their lives to defend the freedoms that we all enjoy every day. For that reason, it is fitting that our, our keynote baccalaureate speaker this year is Tim Lee. John and Wanda Lee dedicated their son to God following his birth in 1950. Tim Lee was a born fighter and grew to develop a rebellious and hostile attitude toward authority. Every inch of his life from childhood was a battle. He was a natural fit for the Marines and joined in 1969. After his training, he received orders to serve in Southeast Asia. In March of 1971, Tim Lee was marching along a, gr a grassy trail in Vietnam. In that moment, a landmine explosion severed two lower limbs and placed him in the fight of his life. Dropping from 187 pounds to 80 pounds, doctors and nurses did not expect him to live, but God's plan for him was to carry the message of Jesus around the world. After his After his call to preach in 1973 and following a year of itinerant evangelistic preaching, Tim Lee was a pastor for five years before becoming a full-time evangelist in 1979. Since then, he has traveled millions of miles and shared the gospel with countless numbers of people around the world. He still travels over 100,000 miles each year to speak in churches, boot camps, arenas, and never strays from preaching an uncompromised message grounded deep in patriotism, righteous living, and biblical revival. Tim has also served this university as an influential member of its Board of Trustees since 1991. I will now ask Tim Lee and our Provost, Dr. Ron Hawkins, to join me at the podium. In recognition of his sacrificial service to this nation, his, his work as an author, speaker, pastor, and evangelist, as well as his proven leadership in the church, with the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Liberty University, the Doctorate of Divinity degree is hereby conferred upon Tim Lee with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereunto. Please welcome Dr. Tim Lee. Well, thank you. Thank you so uh, very, very much. And as a, a definite honor that I will treasure for the rest of my life. And uh, I'll probably say a little bit more about uh, Liberty University in a few moments. I do have family members with me. I wanted to introduce 
uh, tonight. My wife Connie is here, and then our son Brian and his wife Jennifer, our youngest daughter Amber, and her husband Jonathan, and two granddaughters, uh, Allie and Sarah. I want you all to stand because I want you people to meet my family. Say hi and welcome my family tonight. We have uh, our oldest daughter and her husband are not here, and then we have four grandchildren that are not uh, here as uh, well. But I appreciate uh, them being a part of this evening and uh, opportunity to come here at Liberty University. I've got a little bit of good news I want to share real quickly. I do this in all of our meetings and crusades and events. For the last three and a half years, some of you are uh, familiar with this, but those of you that are not, I was invited to speak at uh, Paris Island. MCRD, if you're going to be an enlisted Marine, you either go to MCRD San Diego or MCRD Paris Island. It normally depends on which side of the Mississippi River you're from. And they asked me if I'd be interested in coming and speaking at the Protestant chapel on Sunday morning. Of course, I was interested. I speak at a lot of military bases and, and uh, uh, here at home and overseas as well. But most of the time, it's what I call a gratuitous type invitation. They want me to come and talk for a few minutes and then they give me a plaque or something. And I'm not totally against that, but I want to see people saved. I want to see lives change. And that's what our ministry is about. And, um, they promised me that that was not what this was. This was Sunday morning Protestant Chapel that I would have between an hour and a half to two hours without any restrictions. I said, well, I don't get that kind of liberty in some Baptist churches I go to. So, <laughs> and, uh, so they went through the uh, channels to get it all uh, set up. The last uh, approval had to come from the CO of the base. For the first time in the history of Paris Island, they had a female commanding officer, Brigadier General Roy Reynolds. Uh, about six foot four, and a Marine. And, um, and she was raised a Catholic her entire life, and some time ago, four and a half or five years ago, she was invited to a ladies' Bible study. They were studying the Gospel of John. And for the first time in her life, she understood what the Gospel was, and she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. And now she's in a position to make a decision as to whether I would come and speak to the recruits. I always say that God's timing is always perfect. And they showed her a DVD of me speaking at Prestonwood Baptist Church in Dallas, and with tears in her eyes, she said, yes, our recruits need to hear him. We've now been to Paris Island 12 different events. Every time we go, it's a brand new recruit class, anywhere from 2,000 to 4,500 recruits, depending on what time of the year that we go. Mark Ivey and the worship team from Trinity Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida comes, and they leave worship for 45 to 50 minutes. To hear 4,000 Marine recruits singing, God's not dead, will put goosebumps on top of your goosebumps. And then I get up and I, I get up and I preach, and I told him that when I came that I would want to give an invitation. I'm an evangelist. If you have me come to your church, I'm going to give an invitation. That's the way I am. And we have seen, and this is a conservative estimate, over 17,000 recruits leave their seats and come and give their heart to Jesus Christ in the last three and a half years. <laughs> Been the most amazing thing. We will be back there three more times this year. They've already scheduled it for four times in 2017, four, th uh, four times in 2018. And I told you that basically to ask you to uh, pray uh, for these events. You can follow us on Twitter at Marine Tim Lee and find out more about them, Facebook as well. I tell people if you don't love Jesus and you don't love America, you will not enjoy following me on Twitter. I didn't go 10,000 miles away from home to Vietnam, give two legs for this country to come back here and be politically correct while America is being destroyed. To the graduates, tomorrow is going to be one of the greatest highlights and the greatest days of your entire life. Only 65% of high school students go to college, and only half of those graduate from college. You've achieved a great, great milestone in your life. We're today and this evening in one of the most amazing academic and learning centers in the world. And tonight I want to leave with you in the few moments that I have a challenge. It's going to be a little bit different than maybe uh, what you were expecting or what you might be used to. But 
I am somewhat different and somewhat unusual, and so you should expect that by now. I want to give you something to think about. I believe tonight, seriously, that if we don't get this right, that the results for our children and our grandchildren are going to be catastrophic. You sat through many convocations and lectures and sermons over the past four years. And tonight, let me have your attention for one more before you graduate on tomorrow. Let me have your undivided attention for just a few moments. In a book written by Joel Tyler Headley, about the title, Chaplains and Clergy of the Revolutionary War. It's a part of America's history that's not studied a lot, but it should be. It should be taught. It should be studied. This is probably a book that ought to be taught in every high school and every college and university in America. And this quote, in every quiet little valley sequestered nook in New England, the pastor had taught the doctrines of freedom and preach the duty of resistance to oppression. Listen to those words again. The pastor had taught the doctrines of freedom and preached the duty of resistance to oppression. They had been taught from the pulpit that it was the cause of God. And they took it up in full belief that they had His blessing and His promise from the consecrative hand of the man of God went forth a thousand separate bands that soon met and stood shoulder to shoulder on the smoking heights of Bunker Hill. This was an introduction to this great book about chaplains and clergymen during the Revolutionary War. It is an honor for me to be back on Liberty Mountain. I do have some history, maybe some history that even people on this platform have never heard before. In 1973, January of that year, I drove 650 miles from my hometown of McLeansboro, Illinois to Lynchburg, Virginia. My intention was to come and see this uh, relatively new college at that time called Lynchburg Baptist College, and I was interested in uh, enrolling in Lynchburg Baptist College. And I drove here. When I stepped on the landmine that our chancellor mentioned a little while ago, it took me from 187 pounds to less than 80 pounds, eight months in a hospital, 13 major operations. And when I got home and Connie and I got married, I weighed about 110 pounds and I was still very weak. And when I came here in 1973, uh, just like it is today, there were hills everywhere. I'm talking about for a guy in a wheelchair with very little strength, and I've got to thinking to myself as I sit there at Thomas Road Baptist Church, by the time I get to the class, they're going to be dismissing, and I'm not going to get there in time. And so I did not enroll at uh, Liberty uh, University, Lynchburg Baptist College at that time, but something did happen in that, in that uh, 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 trip I met for the first time and shook the hand of Dr. Jerry Falwell. I pastored a small church in Southern Illinois. On Sunday mornings, I would watch Dr. Falwell on the old time gospel hour. Doug Oldham would sing, and the choir would sing, and then Brother Jerry, as he was affectionately known by so many, would preach the Word of God. When I left the house to go preach to my people, I was fired up. I was encouraged. I was ready to go preach. I took some of our folks one time to Robert Stadium in Evansville, Indiana, to hear Jerry Falwell. We were in the crow's nest way up at the top, but we felt blessed just to be so close to this giant of a man. On the way home, at a stoplight, there was a pounding on the back of our bus, and someone yelled, it's Jerry Falwell. He had jumped out of his vehicle and come pounding on our uh, uh, bus, uh, the back of our bus, just to say hello to us. Some of you will think that this is arrogant for me to say this, but I promise you I do not intend it that way at all. I used to sit and watch the old time gospel hour, and I would think that someday I'm going to preach on the old time gospel hour for Dr. Jerry Falwell. He didn't know me from Adam. My church averaged maybe a hundred on Sunday morning, but I just knew in my heart that somehow I was going to preach for Dr. Jerry Falwell. I started preaching at Thomas Road Baptist Church and at Liberty University for the first time in 1984. I was on the Old Time Gospel Hour numerous times. I spoke many times at what they called the Super Conference in those days, and at Liberty University scores and scores of times. This place to me is like family. I made that introduction to say tonight that, in my opinion, there's been no one 
like Jerry Falwell, in the last 100 years, all of us tonight are still benefiting and enjoying the results of his vision, of his work, of his labor of love. And I still, I still feel that vision and I still feel that passion when I come to this property. And this evening, I want you to consider a very special challenge. There's no place in the world I would rather bring this message. And I believe the potential response uh, here tonight is the highest in the world. We lost something. And when I say we, I'm talking about we who profess to be Christians. We're, we who are politically uh, conservative, uh, political conservative Christians. We who still believe the historic American principles we learned about in our homes, in our churches, in our Christian schools. We've lost something. We've lost our identity. In all the public debate, debates and confrontations over moral and civic issues going on today in hundreds of cities and towns in America, in all all the political issues going on, as America finds herself in a desperate struggle to redefine who she is. In all of this, the one great thing that is missing tonight in America, in my opinion, is the pulpit. Jerry Falwell did something unprecedented in the 1970s, well into the 1980s, and that with the exception of a few men like Dr. D. James Kennedy and a few others. There's never been done again in this nation since. Jerry Falwell made the church the central voice, the leading voice in moral and ethical issues in America. Many of us did not realize at the time what he was doing. He was relinking our American heritage. He was putting the voices and the writing and thinking of the revolutionary forefathers back in our minds and our hearts. What he was trying to teach us, the direction in which he was leading us was perfectly in line with what our American forefathers did over 240 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, we must recapture that same vision, that same spirit and determination that pounded in the breast of our American forefathers. We're going to have to do it, or we're going to lose our identity permanently. As God-fearing people, a liberty-loving, Christ-centered, civilized society, John Wingate Thornton said, to the pulpit, the Puritan pulpit, we owe the moral force which won our independence. That's an amazing statement. One historian said it this way, political liberty and religious truth are vitally intertwined. The role of clergy as the philosophers of the American founding is a salient fact in American history. Edmund Burke, the great British statesman, in vain tried to remind the House of Commons before the outbreak of the hostilities in the new colonies of the inseparable alliance between liberty and religion. Listen to that phrase again, the inseparable alliance of liberty and religion among Englishmen in America. Let me ask you, where are the thundering pulpits of America today? We live in a time where powerful dark forces are threatening to take from us our most cherished freedoms and beliefs. Where are the pulpits? Where are the patriots? Where are the preachers in America today? Have we forgotten that it was the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield who played a major role in rescuing England from the social and political corruption? Where are the pulpits? Have we forgotten the vital role played by early American pulpit in this nation? This material that I share with you, and I won't be able to give it all to you, but I share with you this evening is almost like being lost in a forest, and you don't have a clue which direction you should go. And then you look down, and there at your feet is a compass laying on the ground, and you can follow it, the needle back to true north. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, we can learn something from our forefathers during the time of the Revolutionary War, and I'm talking especially from the preachers and the pulpit of that time. I want you to listen to an excerpt of a sermon preached in 1814 in Boston by Jesse Appleton, president of Bodine College. His text was Isaiah 33, 6, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. I'll only be able to touch on a couple of highlights, but listen to this. He said, an enlightened people will know how to value their rights. 
Notice the word rights. He's talking about our public and governmental rights as a free society. He said a union of wisdom, knowledge, and the fear of God will contribute to the prosperity of a nation by increasing its power. As long as America believed in God, our country and our government remain strong. But as our chancellor said a moment ago, there are people in this nation are bent on trying to kick God out of everything. They want God out of government. They want God out of our schools. They want God out of society. But I'm telling you that America was built with a foundation with God in the center of everything. Today we've lost our power as a nation. We're no longer feared by our enemies, we're no longer respected by our allies. We're ridiculed and we're laughed at. Just as Jeremiah spoke about Israel, he said in Lamentations 1-7, Jerusalem remembered the days of her affliction and of her miseries, all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old, when her people fell in the hand of the enemy and none did help her. The adversary saw her and did mock at her Sabbath. And then he said, all that passed by clapped their hands at me. They hissed and wagged their head at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All thine enemies have opened their mouth against thee. They hiss and gnash the teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Certainly this is the day that we look for. We have found it. We have seen it. And then he said in 412, Lamentations, the, king of the, the kings of the earth. And all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a picture of where we're at in America today. Appleton continued, a well-informed people know the advantages of the civil compared with the savage state. They know that where there is a civil society, there must be a law, and that law implies restraint. Well, listen. How did those people in that day become informed? He said, an informed people. I'll tell you how they became informed. From one place, the pulpit. We've lost that knowledge and that restraint today. The eruption of violence that we see in our land proves that. We're seeing an unprecedented moral collapse of our nation. I don't want to scare any children in the building tonight, but I would like to scare some graduates and some parents and some professors and some of this administration and people in this building. And this is a wake-up call. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not an alarmist. I'm a realist, and I'm here to tell you tonight that we are in deep, serious trouble. Serious trouble in America. In 1864, a man by the name of T.J. Henley put together an amazing book called The Chaplains and Clergy. He picks up the same theme as Mr. Appleton in speaking about the, re of the American Revolution. He said these preachers of the American Revolutionary War period did not confine themselves merely to a dissertation on doctrinal truth. They grappled with the great questions of the rights of man. There it is, that word, rights again. This amazing revolutionary preacher combined doctrinal truth and the political rights of man in his preaching. He said in reading these discourses, one is struck with a thorough knowledge that these men possessed of the origin, nature, object, character, and end of all true government. These revolutionary area preachers, Mr. Headley said, went to the very foundations of society and showed the natural rights of men were. There the word is again, rights. What has happened to our generation? We've been so hammered by the phrase separation of church and state that we have allowed our pulpits to become almost indifferent to the defense and protection of the government and civil rights of man. These words, separation of church and state, are not found in the Declaration of Independence. They're not found in the United States Constitution. They're not found in the Bill of Rights. Yet there are people who actually believe, and there are teachers who teach in the universities of America, that separation of church and state is something that our forefathers founded America on. My friend, I say they've been sleeping on their side too long. Their brain has rolled out their ear. We've been intimidated by the leftist agenda in America, attempting to brainwash God's people and God's people to stay out of government. How foolish. We've followed it hook, line, and sinker. This is, friend, this is America, and we 
need to take it back. The results of listening to the revisionists and the leftist politicians have been disastrous. Today we've surrendered our halls of government to the liberals who have no respect for the Constitution. They don't care anything about our rich history and our heritage. They're more interested in getting your children confused about which bathroom to go to. I'm going to tell you tonight about a particular man from this Revolutionary War in closing tonight. I brought an hour and a half sermon for 25 minutes. I'd rather have too much than not enough. You realize that if we could stir up the pulpits in America again, that's what Dr. Falwell was trying to do. If we could get preachers on fire. You say, well, I just don't know. I'm not sure preachers ought to be all that involved. And Tim, I don't think you ought to be involved. Well, when you get Reverend Jackson and Reverend Sharpton to be quiet, then I might consider hushing up a little bit. I want you to remember this name, Jonas Clark. He was a pastor of a quiet sleepy little town in Lexington, Massachusetts. We've all heard the phrase, quote, the shot heard round the world. We know all about the famous bridge at Concord, Massachusetts, where the Minutemen stood so bravely against the British regulars. But we may not be as aware of this story, of one amazing pastor who lived and ministered in Lexington, Jonas Clark. He was unheard of before the American Revolution. But what would happen almost on his church lawn would soon be known throughout the civilized world. Jonas Clark graduated from Cambridge University at age of 22. He immediately entered into theological studies and at the age of 25 was called to pastor his church in Lexington, Massachusetts. In this small, out-of-the-way country place, he fervently preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, that is the main thing that we do preach, is the gospel, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what will change lives for all eternity. And yet some would have us to believe that that is all we're to preach, but Paul said to Timothy, preach the word, instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine he was talking about what would be happening during the end times, in the end days. In this small, out-of-the-way country place, he fervently preached the gospel. His preaching voice was extremely powerful and could be distinctly heard out of the windows of his church throughout the neighborhood. When the colonies began to resist the representatives of the British government, Jonas Clark stepped immediately to the forefront as an uncompromising patriot and extoller of the virtues of liberty and freedom. Earnestly he discussed from the pulpit the great issues at hand, and that powerful voice thundered forth the principles of personal, civil, and religious liberty and the rights of resistance in tones as earnest and effective as it had the doctrine of salvation by the cross. Long before it was certain that the quarrel must come to blows, Jonas had so thoroughly indoctrinated his people with these great truths that no better spot on the continent could have been found for the British first to try their acts of terror and their intimidation and to make this experiment to subjugate by the colonists by force. That is exactly what hostile politicians in Washington, D.C. are trying to do right now in the state of North Carolina and its governor and his people. We need to pray that Governor Pat McCroy continues to stand for his people, his state, and political religious convictions everywhere. This is not the time for us to be backing up. This is not the time to shut up. This is not the time to be apologizing. This is the time to be strong. This is the time to be courageous. This is the time to be the patriots and to be the Americans that we're supposed to be. And to the pastors, listen to me tonight. If we had pastors in this country with courage and backbone, it might take some pressure off of some of our university presidents.
But Jerry Falwell Jr.'s cut from the same cloth his dad was caught from. Should we expect any less? I don't. I appreciate this man. I appreciate him and Jonathan both and the work that they both do. And God has raised them up for an hour such as this. And great stands need to be taken. And if the preachers are not going to do it, then I guess the presidents will have to do it. This unknown pastor in a virtually unknown town, where a small congregation of people laid the groundwork for the American Revolution. And why do I say that? You ever heard of John Hancock? Does that name sound familiar? His signature is on the Declaration of Independence in those large graphic bow letters. John Hancock was a regular visitor in the home of Pastor Jonas Clark. Hancock learned at the feet of this humble pastor. John Adams was another regular guest in Jonas Clark's home. One small town pastor influenced the coming American government for the cause of liberty from his front living room. With no cell phone, no computer, no Fox or CNN news, this pastor, this preacher of the gospel helped motivate into existence the godly zeal of our American Revolution. What would you do in your town? I'm not asking you this evening to go to Vietnam and give two legs for your country, but I'm asking you to consider the fact that America's in trouble. And as I've said thousands of times, that America, there's some things worth living for. There's some things worth fighting for. And if needs be, there's some things worth dying for. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, especially to the graduates that are about to go out tomorrow, some of you as pastors, some of you will be in pulpits, maybe soon. Then those of you that are not pastors, maybe lawyers and doctors, and maybe educators, maybe all kinds of other professions, but you still have an opportunity to make a difference. You have an opportunity. Jonas Clark made a difference in his day. I wish I could tell you the whole story tonight. Time doesn't allow it. This man, one man, made a great difference. I'm not saying we need to have a, another revolutionary war in America, but I am saying that we need to be ready for the fight. We need to be ready for the battle. We need to be ready to take a stand before it's too late. And I look at my granddaughters and my grandchildren. I don't preach this sermon tonight for my generation. I really don't even preach it tonight for my children's generation. I preach it for my grandchildren. I'm so concerned and I'm broken tonight over America for my grandchildren. What's going to happen if we continue to let them kick God out? If we're going to continue to let wickedness run rampant in the streets of America and let evil take over, then what's going to happen to the America for my grandchildren? So tonight I encourage you, get a burden for your country like you've never had before. Take a stand for what's right. Preach the gospel. Preach the death and the burial and the resurrection. But don't be afraid to get your hands dirty and get your feet wet and take a stand on the other values that made America great. God bless you and God bless the United States of America.
Would you please stand as we close our night in prayer? And I do want to say thank you to Tim Lee for his passionate message tonight. And I also, and I also want to take this opportunity to say on behalf of all of the graduates and all of the staff and the faculty administration of this university, to say thank you to the greatest leader of any university in this country today, to my brother. Thank you for all that you do for Liberty University. We appreciate you. And for those visiting with us, they were not saying boo. That is true. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together tonight and to lift up the name that is above every name, the name that one day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus and Jesus alone is Lord. We stand here today and we are so grateful for the fact that you loved us despite our sin, despite our background, despite what we have done, despite what we have heard what we have uh, done to other people, the way that we have treated others, regardless of what country that we've come from, regardless of the skin color that we have, that you love the entire world enough to give your only son, Jesus, to die on the cross, to be buried, and victoriously three days later to walk out of that tomb to give each and every one of us who believe the promise and the gift of eternity in heaven because of Christ and Christ alone. And so, God, we pray that tonight as we leave this place, I pray for every person gathered in this room, everyone watching this program, wherever they might be, that if they do not know you as their Lord and Savior, God, I pray that right now you would speak to their hearts, God, that you would speak directly into their lives right now, and let them know that despite what their background looks like, that God, that you love them, that you love them so much that Jesus died for their sins, and all they must do is to believe that Jesus Christ is your Son, that He died and that He rose again, and they will experience salvation. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, and God, we are grateful. God, I thank You for all of the graduates that leave this place tomorrow and to go out to different places all over the world as representatives of the truth of the gospel. God, I thank You for the families that are represented here. And God, I just pray that you would continue to lift them up and use them as lighthouses, as we heard tonight, in a very dark world, in a world that desperately needs to know that the answer to our troubles is not found in the White House. It is found in the name of Jesus. God, we pray that you would let us be part of the people who take that message to the world. And we give you the praise, we give you the glory, you're the only one worthy of our praise. And we pray this prayer in the name of your precious Son and our amazing Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.